<laughs> God's sake. Uh, welcome to season 9, episode 18 of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about snaps. <laughs> you alright though? No, I'm good. We also have some <laughs> command line love, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Mark, and joining me this week are Alan. Hello. Laura. Hello. And Martin. Hello. Are you alright, Mark? I'm alright. I'm alright. So, Just Martin. away on his own. <laughs> What have you been up to since last we spoke? Who me? Yes. Oh goodness! You're I was t- taking. I, I am. I am. I know. I know this. This is. This is a true thing. Um, <laughs> well, following a couple of weeks ago, we did an episode about Ubuntu for devices and my. How you don't use it? Yeah, basically, and the reasons for that. I. Uh, I uh, gave myself a, a stern, stern talking to. Uh, and uh, I've been using Ubuntu Touch far more. So I'm now a two-phone individual. I Mm -hmm. leave the house with my uh, Android phone and my Nexus 4 running Ubuntu Touch, and I am slowly transitioning critical functionality over to um, my my Ubuntu Touch device. And, for example, just then my watch buzzed. I've got my Pebble watch on. My Pebble watch just buzzed and it was a telegram message from Popey reminding me to tell you all about the cat story after the show. And uh, my Pebble is connected to my Ubuntu Touch phone using the Rockworks app, which is available from this new thing I found called the Open Store. So if you've used UApp Explorer, which is uh, where you can go and, you know, find uh, Ubuntu Touch apps. Uh, if you go to open.uappexplorer.com, there is a small subsection of apps in there, some of which are unconfined, which means they can do anything they like. But most of those apps are, are written by the uh, rather fabulous um, Michael Zanetti, um, so they are trustworthy, and one of which is this Rockworks app for the Pebble Watch. And I have to say, the Pebble Watch experience in conjunction with Ubuntu Touch is as is equivalent and as featureful as what I've been doing with Android. I was amazed at just how complete it is and you can install apps and watch faces from the ubuntu phone and you can configure them and everything that i have done before all works i was really really impressed excellent awesome uh that's another thing that i named by the way thank you very much you're what, welcome. The, the open store or rock no, work rock work yeah all oh, right yeah should work in marketing i should yeah i should name more things no i shouldn't because i'm terrible at it that was just a lucky streak <laughs> what about you mark what are you up to uh i went to download festival but you downloaded the whole thing i downloaded the whole festival. Well, you just sat in a field downloading things yeah well, at torrents yes. and stuff no no it sounds no, quite dull no. it, it's it's a heavy metal festival oh one of those one of those yes so i saw lots of awesome metal bands and i got rained on an awful lot that is That'd be a lot of soggy hair. Uh, I, mean, I had a I had a, a waterproof poncho on for both. I didn't of it. just mean you. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. <laughs> All the other yeah. waterlogged heavy metal. It was it was it was the mud that was the issue more than the rain. Is it a residential <sighs> one or is it one where you just go for the day? A, a residential one. There's a campsite. Yes. Right. Yes. So the but yeah, it all just turned. So it wasn't so much mud by the end of it as kind of brown water. Like quite, it was quite unpleasant. Do you actually mm. end up sleeping in the tent or not bother? Yeah, I slept in the tent. The, the tent was fine inside. Just outside was, was lots of mud. Right. Yes. Super. <laughs> Shall we get on with the show? <laughs> Let's. I think so. <laughs> You'll have heard us chat about snaps quite a lot lately, so we thought we might have a full-on discussion about them. Um, so you can find out what they are if you haven't really followed along. And so we can um, find out what they are. Yeah, well, I might find out <laughs> probably we should, what we they should are. probably know this sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, whatever. What are snaps? Let's oh, start blimey. with that. Come on, someone who knows these things. So there's a few parts to it, but a snap is essentially a package. A package that contains some software, really. That's like, you know, like a Debian package. Kind of like a Debian package. Kind of mm. like any software package. You know, they're all 
they're all just a means to deploying software to users really aren't they and yeah. that's that's really what a snap is it's it's uh, it's, a, it's a zip file with some software in right but mm. it's not mm. it's not a zip file it's a <laughs> it's a squash fs file which oh, means I love that squash. Yeah. Uh, which means it's compressed. Well, there's a couple of things that are interesting. Well, technically speaking, you know, it's just a it's just a package that contains software. But one of the interesting artifacts of it being a squash FS uh, mounted uh, file system is it's read only. So uh, your application uh, data uh, information can't get corrupted by something else because it's read only so you can't like accidentally remove a file that that is buried somewhere in your application directory um and also the fact that it's compressed means it actually takes up less space on disk and with a following wind should load faster mm. because you're doing less disk io because you're reading compressed blocks off disk so there are some advantages to that technical side and then where they sort of differ from Debian packages, if you install a Debian package, it goes and evaluates what the dependencies are, so what other libraries it requires to install on your operating system and for that for that bit of software to work. Whereas a snap includes the application and all of the other libraries and assets it needs in order to function. But Does that not make them very big then, though? They can be a bit Potentially. big. And does it uh, not make the installation footprint even bigger? Well, uh, not not really. Potentially smaller because if you've got, like, let's take for example a, a well-known popular game called Xenotic. Uh, Xenotic in the Debian world is broken up into a couple of Debian packages. There's like the game, and then there's another Debian package which has got like some game data, maybe maps and 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 uh, graphics and stuff like that. So in a Debian world, you'd install the Deb, and that would be unpacked, and all the files would be you know, put in specific places on your file system. And the other deb that's got all the other bits that it depends on would also be unpacked somewhere on your file system. Um, and all the other dependencies as well. Whereas the snap that contains Xenotic has all of that in compressed form on your disk. So it doesn't get unpacked until um. you run it. And when you run it, it's unpacked on the fly into memory. Okay, so it, it doesn't, doesn't stay unpacked. It no, and it doesn't necessarily. I mean, that's not always the case, and sometimes mm. a, a package may be bigger um, because it, it inevitably has some dependencies inside it. But that's not always the case, and there are some mitigating things that are being done by the Snappy team that will reduce that occurrence. And so we we've sort of got this convention with Debian packages that basically you kind of break it up into the minimum viable pieces, and then you have them all rely on each other, but. There's no actual reason that you can't have your application with all the dependencies statically linked inside a Debian package and install that, is there? So why is it that what? Well, what's... you you could, but the the Debian um, guidelines probably wouldn't allow that. Well, yeah, no, I mean, but the packaging format is still um, is still viable for packaging a statically linked application. Right. So yeah, what is it that that Snap gives us that? Well, um, just, just we couldn't that... just do that with a Debian package. Just on that, whilst you're saying statically linked, and I, I know you're not making this exact point, but snaps by default are not statically linked executables. So they are an executable that is dynamically linked to the libraries that it requires within its SquashFS file system. If you wanted to, there's nothing to stop you making a snap of a binary that is statically linked, but by default you don't need to do that. What's the difference? Statically Does, linked is the binary and all of the libraries it requires in one big, massive executable. And dynamically linked is the binary, and then uh, it's linked to the individual libraries that it requires functionality from. So inside the snap, you might have a directory called bin with your executable in and a directory called user lib. And in user lib, there might be lib foo and lib bar and lib baz. And when you run your binary, it will load lib foo, lib bar, lib baz as as required oh, okay just like a, a a standard linux system it's just yeah. it's it's exactly the same it's just in a different location the other thing that snaps give you that that is not not done with debian packages is the confinement so using app armor to confine what the app can do so one application can't touch the files of another application yeah. um and so with um something we were mentioning 
in the news in the previous show was interfaces and being able to define what the, the developer being able to say what they want their application to be able to do. Like, can it talk to the Unity 7 indicators? Can it connect to the network? Can it bind to a, um, a specific port or can it, you know, check the firewall config and stuff like that? If, if your application doesn't need to do those things, then it doesn't need to specify those things and then it won't be able to do those things. Whereas by default on a Linux system, any app can basically do anything. And, and to build on that, another feature of of not just Debian packages, we're, we're probably going to talk around Debian packages because they're the ones that we're most familiar with, but Debian packages can have post and pre-install scripts that need to do some sort of um, set up and tear down um, during the installation and removal process. And those scripts have to run in the root context when you're installing and removing packages in Debian. And... This is why there is checks and balances in Debian and Ubuntu with peer review on packages going into the archives to make sure that there's nothing nefarious or unintentionally accidental that might do bad things in those maintenance scripts, as they're called. And in snaps, whilst you don't want bad stuff in snaps, they are confined. So if there's bad stuff, it's stuck within its boundaries. But also these tear up, tear down scripts don't run in the root context they run in the context of their confined environments they can't reach outside and touch the rest of the system and do bad stuff in air quotes so snaps were invented basically for ubuntu in the first place um what was the motivation for that so um they're an evolution from clicks so clicks is a, there's a similar concept if you could if you think of like you know, clicks being the 1.0 and snaps being the 2.0. Um, clicks implement some of the things that snaps do, but they're not quite as elegant as snaps. It's the 3.0 um, claps. <laughs> <laughs> clicks, snaps, snaps. Maybe. So, uh, I'll put, I'll so, put, I'll suggest that to Mark and see what he says. <laughs> yeah, he might go for it. So clicks, uh, yeah, so clicks were they what made it possible on the Ubuntu touch? Um, operating system to sandbox apps for the better security. Uh, yes, yes. Right. So, but it wasn't. It was. It was somewhat limited. Um, and also, clicks don't have the whole squash FS thing. The files just get unpacked on your file system, just like uh, okay. yeah. Um, but in a special directory. But it's it's still not as not as elegant as snaps. Um. So yeah, there's some advantages that, and and, and snaps also um, by having this snapd daemon, which is the the thing that actually manages the, the installation of the snaps, and having that portable and running on not just on Ubuntu but on other distros means that a developer could create a snap, and that snap potentially install on any distro, not just on Ubuntu. Whereas typically, if someone creates a PPA and puts their application in a PPA, then that application only runs on Ubuntu. Or you, you go to like you go to the you know, whatever website for some random Linux application or cross platform application and it will have installation instructions for Windows, instructions for Mac, and then the instructions for Linux will be if you're on Fedora do this, if you're on Ubuntu do this, if you're on Debian do that. Whereas what it could do is potentially just link to a snap that could run on any of them. That's that's the goal is is having a unified package format that will just work everywhere. And one thing which I thought was quite interesting about that is the big problem that Ubuntu has on phones at the moment is lack of apps, really. And having a universal package format means that more people are going to be interested in packaging as snaps, which means that when the phone moves over to using snaps, there'll be more available which you can run on the phone. Maybe. Yeah. The 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 don't forget that the phone also runs Mia yes. and not X. So if you're packaging an X app or an app that depends on X, it's a little bit more tricky. But also the phone is ARM. Whereas if someone's packaging a desktop app, ah, so you a still traditional have to have, desktop app, you, right, need, you still, still have to have, have a separate have the, build. Well, yes, and the Snappy Store does support multiple builds of the same Snap, so you can upload like an ARM HF version, an AMD 64, an i3 at 6 and stuff. And I, I don't know what the plan is for moving the phone to Snaps because that's that changes because Snappy is under development. So, you know, whether that will be a you know a prudent way to do it or whether there's going to be some dynamic translation or what, I don't know. But I think that's being discussed internally, 
like over the next couple of weeks or so. Since you mentioned the Snappy store, um, so currently um, Snap, the utility for installing Snaps, if you ask it to install something, it will look in the Snappy store. Am I right? Uh, it look in two places. It'll either look, if you, spe- if you just say Snap install next cloud yeah. then it will go to the 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 snappy store get next cloud and then download the it will go and get the the snap file um but there's a lot of other moving parts in there as well like yeah. your your ubuntu one credentials in the store and stuff so yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts but it it then installs it uh, the other option is if you had the next cloud snap on your on yeah. your file system. So, you know, you went to nextcloud.com and they said, hey, we've got a beta version. It's not in the store because we're just testing it. Download it here and you just click on it. It downloads the snap to your file system. You could do snap install dot slash nextcloud, blah, 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 dot snap. Yeah. And it would install it locally. Right. But there's yeah. only one store at the moment, right? It's not like an app yeah. where you can have, you anyone could run their own repository on their own server. Right. But the the idea is that anyone could spin up a HTTP server serving up snaps with a web front end and, you know, authentication if you want it or not, if you don't and allow snaps to install from there. Oh, that, okay. So it's just, that is uh, it's just in case of implementing the API basically. Right. It's not a right. hard requirement that you have to use our store. Yeah. And I would expect that some distros wouldn't want to, you know, yeah. it makes it harder because then, the, then there's multiple places you could go to get snaps, but then that's the same as it is on Android. You know, you've got the one master store that's, mm-hmm. that, that most people use the Play Store, but then there's the F Droid store, there's the Amazon store, there's, you know, there's possible other stores. And I think, um, once it's got wider adoption, there may well be multiple stores. And out there. there's a couple of important points in what you've described there, which is for um, longstanding Linux users, the paradigm doesn't change. Instead of apt get install, you snap install, it goes to a central repository, thing is downloaded and installed on your system. Unlike, for example, app image, where you go somewhere and you download an app image and then you make the app image executable and then you install it and then you've got a thing that never then gets updated ever again on your system. What's that image? Uh, it's an, it's another one of the uh, competing standards along with Snaps and uh, Flatpak. And there's another one I forget the name of. Begins with so that. App, Auto app image is the one that's been around the longest mm. and has way more... Um, way more users you know if you want to call it that than than any of the others at the moment and there's there's a few of them there's like four or five well it's probably more than that there's about seven or eight different competing standards of which snappy is just one and app image is one that's been around for a lot longer and and where app image is more familiar to say mac os and windows users is you go to the website of the vendor of the piece of software that you want you download an app image and you install it and Snaps can do both those things. You can install from a central repository, or as the vendor, you can publish a Snap on your website, and you can, as a user, download that Snap and install it. Whereas on Ubuntu, you could... Op- I mean, we've talked about like using the command line tools like Snap install, but actually, you open the Ubuntu store, you know, the, yeah. which is based on GNOME software, and just type in the thing you want to find or you browse around and then you click on the thing you want to install. So you don't, you know, as a user, you're doing the browse around the store, click to install it thing yeah. rather than the browse around the internet, download a random executable, make it executable, run it thing. Yeah. yeah and if you're and that, using... And that way you get updates. If you're using the Ubuntu software, then you don't necessarily know that you're installing a deb versus a snap from the user interface point of view. The process is identical. Where are where are we at with the status of this? I mean, are we in the next version of Ubuntu going to be installing with Snaps instead of Apt? Or? Um, so in sixteen oh four, Snap D, which is the thing that you know does the installation, um, is in by default, and GNOME software has the plugin to be able to install Snaps. So that's already there, and once more developers have. You know, once once it once it matures, because uh, it's still under active development, and once uh, it matures a bit more, and people are uh, confident with creating and updating their snaps, they can upload them to the store, and users can get them. And that so that's already the case in sixteen oh four, and sixteen oh four is an LTS, so it's got a long life cycle. 
So it makes sense for people to target that. Um, for other distros, um, I don't know. Um, you know, it's the same software. It's still Snap D on those as well. Um, in future releases, I can't, I, I can't quite see us completely ditching Debs. And I don't think we would. I think there would always be a place for a Debian based desktop, but the, the thing that's been talked about a lot in the past is a snappy personal edition, um, which is like a, an image that is just snaps and is not you wouldn't you wouldn't run app app get on it. And, and you you mentioned Debs there, and it's probably important to point out the the role that Debs play in snap packages. So when you're creating a snap package, uh, you're editing a YAML file called snapcraft.yaml. Um, one of the th you can do many things in there. There are what are called plugins, which is what allows you to define the build system or the nature of the application that you're uh, snapping. So there are things in there for Python two, Python three, and Node, and Auto tools, and Make, and just about everything you can imagine. When you're creating your package, you don't have to build everything from source inside your snap. You can just build the main or request the source code for the main application that you're interested in from the tip of kit git or a tagged version of git for said application but then you specify what the build packages are so the packages that you need to satisfy the dependencies of this piece of software and those packages are actually pulled in via apt from the traditional debian style archive right. so you don't have to build everything out you can use the secret source of the debian archive as the framework on which the foundation upon which to build the snaps but you said that the snaps have the benefit of this of it being um more secure because it sort of bounds everything that it, within a snap but if you've got a mixture of snaps and debians on your machine how's that's not going to help massively well the snaps are built using debs but the resulting snap is completely isolated. So when you install the snap package, it just installs that snap. Those Debian dependencies have already been resolved inside that snap. So when you install the snap, it doesn't then go off and start hunting for Debs and stuff. But Alan said that there's always a place for Debs. Yeah, there's always a place for Debs. I mean, the, the desktop is built from Debs. The core image is built from Debs. So there's always a, a place for Debs. And it's it's probable that not everything is suitable to be packaged as a snap. For example, it might not make sense to make your compiler a snap. Uh, it might for some people, but it and and some of the real low level libraries, you you know, and things like sed and orc, you probably wouldn't make a snap out of. Those would come as part of the the you know the base image, which would have been built from the Debian package of sed and orc and whatever those other base libraries are. So there's still a place for it. It's not, it's not going to go away. I don't think. Um, oh. Sorry. Go on. No, no, that's it. So what are the flavors of Linux are supporting it or potentially supporting it so far? So there's, um, I think arch has it in the arch user repository. And, uh, I think, uh, Fedora's got it in copper. Fedora's got it in copper, and I think there was another one. I can't remember which one it was. I know Gen 2 has it somewhere. Uh, Gen 2, that's it. Um, so, yeah, there's a few. They're listed on snapcraft.io, the, the various logos on the website. But, um, yeah, it's uh, the, <laughs> there's a lot to learn, and, uh, I, and, I, and I guess it's going to take a while for it to bed in on lots of other distros because it's taking a while to bed in on Ubuntu, but we're getting there. Have we answered most of your questions, Laura? I'm just thinking. Well, we'll have to because <laughs> we've run out of time. <laughs> okay. But if but if you had any more questions, we can certainly cover them in another in another section. Yeah. If there uh, are people later. out there with additional questions, send them into the show as feedback, and we'll hopefully be able to answer them at a later date. Or alternatively, leave them as a comment on the uh, on this episode on the website. Yes. Go to ubuntupodcast dot org and leave them as a comment. We can we can answer them directly there, and uh, then other people can see the answers as well. Good idea. Yep. Sweet. Cool. Thank you. And 
now it's time for command line la 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 love as <laughs> as Mycroft calls it. <laughs> um, and it's a really easy one, and it's a really brief one, and you probably already heard of it. But I wanted to give a shout out to a tool that I used this week. Um, a very kind person uh, heard my cries of help when I told them that I had my, I was running out of space on the internal drive on my laptop, and they very kindly gave me an, a larger one, and. Uh, I put that larger one in an external USB 3 caddy, connected it via USB, and booted Clonezilla, which is the tool of this week, off of a USB stick, and just told it to copy bit for bit from one disk to the other, and it did it. It just copies everything from the internal disk to the external disk, and then I had to run Gparted to expand the partition sizes, but other than that, uh, Clonezilla was just an absolute win for me this week copying one di- one hard drive to another I yeah loved it. it deserves a mention because when when you buy you know replacement hard drives a lot of those come with software for windows to help you uh sort of do what you've just described a bit for bit copy of your old disc to your new disc and it's worth pointing out for those people that haven't heard of clonezilla i can't believe there's many because it's just a brilliant tool that that software has existed for years for Linux um, to do disk to disk copying, and uh, if you're upgrading your disk, there's the tool that can help you transition your data and not have to do a full reinstall. Absolutely. So thank you, Clonezilla developers. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. If you'd like to discuss some of the things we talk about with other listeners, post on our shiny new subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash ubuntu podcast. Or you can just leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. Okay then, and here it is. It's time for that feedback. I've got the easy job this week, fellas, so uh, uh, hold on to your hats. Get ready to read. Uh, First up, uh, Andy Smith, our uh, uh, sponsor uh, for our VPS hosting, uh, let us know about some changes that he'd made to the VPS that he sponsors for our podcast. Yeah, he sent me a message on IRC to say, I'm now changing the Ubuntu VPS to the standard one terabyte, two terabyte data transfer allowance. Since it was on less, I didn't have to do anything. He just upped the limit, which I thought was very nice. Thank you, Andy. Thank Thanks, you, Andy. Folk. And And the other thing about this is that this isn't a special for us. I understand that as he notices other companies bump up against their usage limits, they do this just to sort of smooth, smooth the way and keep them running. Nice. Uh, Matthias left a comment on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. I really like the discussion about using or not using Ubuntu for devices. It was open and honest and addresses some of the issues people have been having while using the system. I've been an Ubuntu user for years and I have my home computers running Ubuntu and I've had an Ubuntu phone since April 2015 and it's been my only phone for one year. I'd just like to point to one of the issues I encounter as an enthusiast. People all over the world are using (laughs) using WhatsApp. In my new job, colleagues, customers and suppliers in India, China, Venezuela, they're they're all using it. Currently, I'm out of this group, or I switch to Android or iOS. I could convince my direct colleagues and friends, but not the rest of the world, to switch to Telegram. I can understand why Jane Silber still has not 100% switched to an Ubuntu phone because of this. Alan said quite rightly that if WhatsApp is is there, then there'll be other applications still missing. Yes, that's true, but one uses a central messaging app to stay in touch with other people. If my favourite podcast app is not behaving on, as the one um, on other platforms, then that's my personal choice if I want to use it or not. For interpersonal contact applications, you have to go with the apps that most people use. And that was mainly also the difference in uh, compared with the mid-90s when a PC was my personal tool. So it didn't really matter if um, other people were using other things. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I can see that. Well done, uh, you won the argument with Alan. <laughs> 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 Stefan emailed us at show at ubuntupodcast.org. My wife uses a BQ 4.5. She especially likes the really long standby time as she seldom uses her cell phone. She switched from an old Android 2.x phone. She missed nothing except WhatsApp, but she's fine with Telegram now. I switched from an iPhone 4 to BQ 4.5 to an MX4. 
I used the MX4 as my daily driver with a lot of downs and some ups for 11 months. Unfortunately, some screen sensor broke a month ago and the screen turns black after a short usage, which has made the phone unusable. So I had to switch back to my old iPhone and it's really disgusting. Slow as hell, no <laughs> updates anymore. My favorite apps are not there and outdated user interface concept. Heck, I never thought I'd miss my buggy MX4 so much. Alan is... Uh, Alan, when is an officially supported Ubuntu phone available again? I really need one. Yes, Come I am, because I really else. need one. <laughs> yeah, soon. 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 Oh, really? Is this is this an official thing or optimistically <laughs> hopeful? Uh, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to tell anyone else, right? Okay. Don't tell anyone, right? Okay. Soon. Soon. <laughs> uh, Joan Cybersheep emailed us. About jumping straight to using Ubuntu device as the main one, I did with my phone first and with tablet afterwards. I'm always a bit lazy to jump from one system to another, but this time I had to cut the SIM card to fit in the BQE5, <laughs> so there was no way back. <laughs> that's how you get I like, them. I like your commitment. Uh, yeah, that's what we should do is make all our phones with a proprietary triangular <laughs> SIM card. Um, uh, Joan continues... But why, why I decided to swap? Because if you don't, you're always stuck to the old system. Even I use my old mobile on Wi-Fi to check from time to time WhatsApp. There it is again. I'm lucky that nearly everyone I get in touch with now uses Telegram. I couldn't upgrade my Android 4.2.2, and there's a big security hole in it. I enjoy testing and reporting and translating. It's my little grain of sand to the system. To live, I just need Telegram, podcast app, RSS reader, GPS navigator, and email. So I got more than I needed, and I don't regret the change. That's a really nice email. Thank yeah. you, Joan. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Robert Nunnally uh, tweeted us at Ubuntu Podcast. Good episode. Though pragmatism, pragmatism is good, it's hard to get excited about a mobile platform without canonical folks using it daily. Mm, yeah, possibly. There are some canonical folks who use it daily, and I do use it daily. I just don't carry it with me everywhere. Isn't there use it daily, but not exclusively. Somebody use it daily exclusively for about two years. Yeah, Mike Hall. It's the only. We... It's the only phone he uses. Okay. Um, Tilnash emailed us too. I've been using the Maizu MX4 as a daily driver for the past year, and I've been loving the experience. I feel safe around it, knowing it works for me and does not spy on my private matters. It has some bugs and quirks, and the app selection is not great, but I've found alternatives to everything that I really need, and it's pleasant to use. Especially apps like Podbird, Reddit Mobile, Telegram, and most of all, Terminal. What I miss is a good, stable browser because the default one is a bit mediocre. Unfortunately, after a nasty fall down the stairs, my power button broke and I'm waiting for the parts to arrive. So I'm currently back on Android and I find it a bit uncomfortable. A week ago, I got my shiny new BQ M10 tablet and I've fallen in love with it. The build quality is awesome for the price. OTA 11 performance is great and I love using it as a lightweight browser and bash machine. I rarely turn on my heavyweight powerful Antergos laptop and stick with the desktop tablet combo for the most times. The split screen feature is a bit buggy, but otherwise very useful. Desktop mode works remarkably, and I managed to actually get some work done on the go by connecting the tablet to a 27-inch screen and wow. using it as a touchscreen keyboard combo. If I can get Synergy working on the tablet, it will immensely improve my daily work. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So That's rather awesome. I would just like to back up the fact that all of my devices have now been backed up to OTA 11, and in particular, the experience on the BQM10 is hugely improved. So the big shortcoming was the not rotating screen, and that's now solved, and copy and paste is fiddly to get to work, but it does actually work with all of the applications now and i'm not sure if that was the case in ota 10 and i wasn't patient no. enough to figure out the the nuances of how to move the sliders around but i can copy and paste from everything to everything now which is a a huge step forward um from my point of view uh, neil mcphail sent us feedback via unconventional means yeah uh neil says and this is long so i'm going to pluck a few bits out he and says, also apologize to neil we've had to edit this extensively so sorry if some of your words are taken out of context oh i do that a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the lols uh 
Uh, he says, there are many things I love about Ubuntu on the phone, such as the freedom, openness, and many aspects of the design. I think the swipe from right gesture is a bit overloaded, but otherwise the UI is super. But the question was, why are people not using the phone full time? So I'll focus on the negatives rather than the positive from my perspective. Uh, first off, he mentions performance is slow. Native QML apps, no matter how simple, take seconds to load. This isn't good enough. Uh, development appears haphazard. Uh, rather than getting the basic frameworks, SD card, Bluetooth working well, the developers have been diverted to working on convergence. This hasn't helped the stability of the platform and has brought many more rough edges. Uh, thirdly, design decisions haven't been followed through. In particular, the app lifecycle and confinement aspects have not worked well. Apps are too restricted in what they can and cannot do, and the frameworks which are promised to extend functionality haven't appeared. I would rather have a functional set of apps than a battery which lasts for five days. Number four, this one may be controversial, but I do not feel the OS is as open as it should be. As a consequence of the previous comment, most of the core apps have non-conforming app arbor profiles to perform non-trivial tasks, which is a, a thing that um, not every app would be allowed to do. So there's some exceptions there. He's right on that. Uh, finally, partly as a consequence of all of the above, lots of the important apps are missing from Ubuntu. This is the least of my worries, to be honest. Give me the freedom to choose an alternative or write my own and I'll be happy. But at present, that freedom isn't quite there. I could go on much longer, but these are my biggest bugbears. I think this is a real shame, as Ubuntu has the potential to be the finest mobile OS, and so much great work has been done already. I'm hugely appreciate appreciative to the devs and community for bringing it this far, but more focus is needed to get it working well. Thanks for the nice email. Thank you, Neil. Yes, thank you. After our recent news mentions of OwnCloud, Jonathan Cowell uh, of OwnCloud tweeted us. I can assure you your own cloud I can assure you OwnCloud is up and running. OwnCloud 9.1 release is coming around soon. And uh, when mm. I did my updates earlier today, I got the OwnCloud 9.1 client update, so it's out <laughs> clearly. <laughs> uh, Liam Daw of Gaming on Linux posted on our subreddit slash r slash Ubuntu podcast. Gaming on Linux, like Mark's naming skills, Entroware have released another beast of a laptop worth looking into. <laughs> Is it Mark's naming skills? I yes. think he means me, yes. doesn't he? No, no. <laughs> I'll take credit for that, thanks. <laughs> Uh, David Wolski, <laughs> uh, writer for Linux Velt magazine, commented on our Google Plus page. You don't need PV to monitor DD. Since version 8.24, DD has a nifty new parameter, status equals progress. Oh, and he gives wow. an example. The progress bar won't do much because the file you, you want to write to the drive will be cached. There's another option uh, which is recommended, which will mean that it it doesn't cache it, it writes it straight away. Mm. Uh, also, DD Rescue had a progress bar for quite a while. When writing data to USB, I'd always recommend DD Rescue. Where PV comes in handy is for us uh, command line monkeys is CP, MV, or MD5, like in another example, which we'll post in the show notes. Yeah, so that, that example he's posted there is a good one. So it's PV, name of ISO, pipe it into MD5 some, so you, you get a progress meter whilst it's uh, calculating the uh, hash. Huh. Which is kind of uh, cool. That's so kind of nice. But I've never really been it doing it or not. Yeah, I've never been that impatient to know the MD5 sum for an ISO. Uh, well, it depends how big the ISO is and how slow your computer is, isn't it? Really, I, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. First yeah. world problem. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Asa emailed about uh, PV uh, uh, PV command line love as well. Related to the PV progress tip, DD has a built-in way to show progress. Send the USR1 signal to the DD process, <laughs> and it will print out its progress to standard out. I use this since I never remember to use PV when I start DD, since I'm too lazy to look up PIDs. I usually use kill all, minus user one, DD. Oh, uh, this, is, this is a really weird thing to do, because you, you're, running, you're running DD in one terminal, then you go to the other terminal and run this command, and then it prints out the progress in the first terminal. That's right. Yeah. You can you can exec over to the top of itself. And this technique is the one I'm familiar with for getting progress out of DD. And uh, David Wolski's earlier comment just makes me feel old and irrelevant when I find out that DD now has its own built-in progress meter and I never mm -hmm. knew about it. Uh, Jala 3 d uh, left a comment on our Google Plus page. And this was in response to uh, the last episode, I think. 
says, hmm, Pugbird isn't retrieving this one. That's a first. Martin, are you sure you didn't upload a Mate I saw by accident? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm quite sure. I have more subtle ways to convince people to run Ubuntu Mate. And Freddie sent us a quick email about the bug naming discussion we had. Of course, Buggy McBugface springs to mind. Actually, on that subject, I felt motivated uh, the last time I filed a bug to make a an amusing bug title. Uh, the icon for the HSDPA uh, in the Ubuntu phone is really huge. It like takes up half the screen. Sometimes it, it glitches and the icon is just really, really massive. So I filed a bug that said, there's a, a helicopter landing pad in my indicator screen or something <laughs> like that. It turns out it was a duplicate bug, but oh. um, yeah, I, li- I, I like my title. So I think from now on, I'm going to put amusing bug titles because other people remember it and then they link to it and then it gets triaged quickly if you put amusing bug titles. And eventually there'll just be lots of meaningless book titles. <laughs> well, yeah, there might be a bit of that, yeah. But it's easy to find because they'll be memorable. It's always easy to find a memorably titled bug. When they've um, all got memorable titles, you'll remember them all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, Laura, you can have this. Well, and finally, yeah. Scott left a comment on our website to say, One thing I really like about your podcast is the quality of the audio. I can't listen to some podcasts because they have bad audio. You've taken care of an important part of the podcast, and it's a pleasure listening to your show. Your website is great too. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Well said. And I'm sure every week we make fewer and fewer mistakes. Um, yeah, maybe sometimes. Is that the end of the feedback? That is. Uh huh. And that's all for episode 18. We'll be back next week where we'll have more news, comment and discussion. Hurrah! And events if you send us. If you have, oh, yeah. We didn't have any events uh, this week. If you know of any events, send them in and we'll mention them on the show. I installed a snap while we were talking. Wow. <laughs> what was it? Uh, Nextcloud. I installed it through the software app. Nice. Sweet. Let us know how you get on next week. Yes. Right. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. All right, Martin, tell us your cat story.